nothing of the sort. It is a history of zigzags in which the center of every this zigzag was the interest and the independence of the working class. This is very, very important. And the great thing about Lenin is that Lenin never repeated himself. This is the funny thing about Lenin. I mean, you say Lenin said this in 1903. Why did he say in 1905? It's the opposite. Of course he said the opposite. He said the opposite because the situation changed radically between 1903 and 1905. And therefore, from that I want to explain another problem that Lenin faces all the time. You'll find that the history of Lenin and the history of the Lenin alliance is this. If you look at the 1890s, who was the great hero of Lenin? 1895, 1896, 1897, etc. The great heroes of Lenin, quite rightly, were Plekhanov, the father of Russian Marxism, Axelrod, one of the most important politician tacticians of the Marxist movement in Russia, Vera Zasulic, the heroine of the social democratic movement that was started as ironic, but then became the, really the mother, if you want to call it, of one of the most important Russian Marxists, and so on. Now this was until 1900. From 1900 to 93, when you speak about Lenin, you speak of Lenin and the alliance of Lenin, Martov, and Kotrasov. When you speak from 1903 to 1907, it is Lenin, uh, Lunachar Bogdanov, Lunachar Kikrasi. When you look from 97 to 1917, it is Lenin, Zinoviev, and Kamenev. And you start asking yourself, I don't understand why not only his tactics change, but his allies change. And it's absolutely true, his allies in the movement change. And I'll tell you why. Because basically, the party and the class, the relation between the party and the class are such that it is true that the Marxists can be in advance of the class. It is absolutely true. But every movement has a tendency to conservatism, to traditions, and so on. Because you can't survive unless you have an inertia. And once you have the inertia, when there is a turning point, it becomes, this inertia becomes an impediment for new changes. And what do I mean by that? Between 1881 and 1900, there was no question who was the most important Russian Marxist. It was Klohanov. But you see, he founded Russian Marxism when the movement didn't exist. When he had to write books to prove that the working class is going to rise, that capitalism is going to develop, that one day there will be a labor movement. And it is terribly interesting when groups can describe the reaction to Ple of Plekhanov when Russian workers came abroad to meet Plekhanov after 1900. She said every time when a worker came from Petrograd or Moscow or some other town to Plekhanov, Plekhanov was terribly nervous. He was terribly shaking. And you ask yourself, why? And I'll tell you why. Because for 20 years, his tactics, his politics fitted the situation. Came 1900, and the first thing he did, the, the, the guy described, she said, is it true that it's Russian movement, a labor movement, really? Now he argued from 1881 that there's going to be a labor movement in Russia. Came the real event, the real rising of the movement, and the Khan of Kamha doesn't fit. Then you have Marto, and Kotrasov. Again, they fit the situation. Come the Russian, the rising Russian revolution. That's not the situation they fit in. The situation of the circle, in which we have to have to organize the circle, centralize the circle, having a publication for the circle, etc. And there's no question that Martov was by far the most prolific writer at the time. No political Lenin. He was an excellent as uh, a propagandist, as a man that spread the idea. He was very, very good. Even the first turning to the industrial working class was, to a large extent, the job of Marto. Marto himself came from the Jewish trade union movement, in which, in a, in a way, they were more advanced than the Russian labor movement at the time, and then we brought a whole number of ideas of how to conduct theory with practice. Now, Marto was a very, very great, very, very good comrade. There's no question about it. Came the rising Russian revolution, and Marto's softness, of 1905, I mean, and Markov didn't fit the situation again. And what do you find? You find the Bogdanov, you find the Lolacharovsky, you find the Romantics, and they are marvelous, those people. They are really fighters, good fighters, excellent comrades. I'm not looking at anybody romantic in this hall. You know, sitting in a, sorry. Uh, no, but you know, this is not the problem. You know, of course they fit in a marvelous situation. Came 1907, the Russian workers are being beaten. The Russian revolution is being down and out. Her action is prevailing everywhere. And then you say, you know, when the workers are so badly beaten, when the body is covered with really wounds, when they are one inch from death, 
You know what the workers need? They need to recuperate. They need to rest. They need small victories. They need small achievements. You know, they need the elections to the Tsarist Duma. Now, to elect to the Tsarist Duma, it's fantastic to support the election to the Tsarist Duma. You, that in 1905, vote, fought against the Tsarist Duma. In 1906, you bypassed the Tsarist Duma. Comes 1907, and then he says, we have no alternative. Our point of departure is the workers. And the workers are down and out. They are really beaten to death. They need now a little bit of cooperation. Don't speak about romantic upheaval. It is not just around the corner. We need small achievements in terms of simply a little bit of propaganda, a little bit of parliamentary representation. And it is true that it was very easy for Bogdanov to win against Lenin. Bogdanov did win against Lenin in the Bolshevik faction. There's no question. Bogdanov had the overall majority of the members with him. The whole Bolsheviks were with with Bogdanov against Lenin. And in 1907, when they had the conference here in London, and the question was whether to boycott the Duma or not, all the Mensheviks voted for the boy against the boycott, all the Bolsheviks voted for the boycott, one Bolshevik brought the Bolshevik discipline. His name was Lenin. He voted with the Mensheviks for participation in the Duma elections. Now you see why? Because for him, all concepts, like group interest, democratic centralism, discipline, all those things were always subordinated to one basic thing, the interest of the working class. And therefore he had to break from Bogdanov. It is not a question of personal relations. Lenin loved Martov to the end of his life. In the same way, Lenin loved his brother to the end of his life. But when it came to revolutionary politics, the point of departure was clear. And therefore in 1907 he had to break with Bogdanov, Lulacharsky and so on. And then he had the new people with him. There's an obvious coming here. Now again, it is not good enough to follow the Stalinist story that the lobby coming here always useless. It is not true. The lobby even coming here and Stalin were at the period of reaction, at the period of 1907 to 1912, the period of the desert, the period that horrible life was absolutely disgusting in Russia and was even worse in emigration. As the groups have described, Lenin had a much worse time in the second emigration, in the first emigration, because it was after the victory, after the victory, after the revolution of 1905. At this period, what was the emphasis of Lenin, of Denoviev, and Kamenev, and of Stalin, and of the rest of them? It was very simple. We have to fight against the stream. The criterion of revolutionary capacity is the capacity not to fall into the romanticism of 1905, but to stick to those terrible conditions of using the most smallest, the most narrow opening to revolutionary propaganda, revolutionary action, and so on. Now, the net result is they were safe in the image of 1907 to 1917. When the revolution turned, a new turning in history, the Novi and the simply didn't fit because they were not the children of 1905. They were the children of the action of the period of 1908 and so on. And that's why you find this fantastic phenomena that when it comes to the Russian Revolution of 1917, there's a lobby and the coming of the people who were very close to Lenin. The lobby was with Lenin all the time in immigration. All the articles against the war of 1914 almost, you know, the, uh, against the stream, the collection of articles against the stream, against the war, was signed by Lenin and the lobby. You find that the same Zenobiev and Kamiev, again, are sticking to the past and saying, Comrades, we shouldn't rush. Time is on our side. The danger is in the ultralet. And Lenin says, no, 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 no. The danger was in the ultralet in 1908. Now the danger is in the opportunist, is in the right wing of the party. Now you look at this process, why I'm describing it? Because you can't understand it all, Lenin and Bolshevism. Unless you speak in terms of the interrelation between the party and the class. Not the question is the party is always in advance of the class. It's simply not true. Not always the party knows all the answers and the class simply follow it. It is simply not true at all. The party itself, being in advance of the class, becomes at a certain stage an impediment to the class. And that's why you find Lenin in 1917, when he comes to Russia, in April, when he comes to the Finland station and announced uh, his statement about the war. What did he say about the war? He said the war continues. The provisional government is a provisional government. You say that you made a revolution in Russia in February. What did you achieve? The landlords are still owning the land. The capital is still on the factories. What you did here in France, they did much better 150 years before. What the hell are you talking about? Down with the war, down with the provisional government. And when he stated that, next day, his speech 
and the April Treaties of Lenin are published in the form of individual contributions.